If anybody's been trapped in an elevator, 20 minutes can be a pretty long time, right? And alone, trapped in an elevator mm -hmm. for 20 minutes, not knowing what's going to happen, not knowing where you are, a sense of sensory deprivation. Um, think about that as your life, not 20 minutes, not an hour, not, and the only guy on the intercom is not the guy who's trying to get you out, the guy who's keeping you in is your communication. And that's the existence. Our war on terror begins with Al-Qaeda, but it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. I think we've lost more in the war on terror. So, you know, empires in decline resort to torture. And I think it gives them the illusion of mastery and dominance and control. By torturing, essentially we blind ourselves. But we could, in fact, create a democratic society which actually has consistently valuable and effective techniques to fight terror. The fact that we don't is more an expression of our own anxieties and fears. The so-called enhanced interrogation techniques used by uh, the U.S. officials were basically designed as techniques to break down the human mind and therefore also the body, because they are very connected, uh, and leave no physical traces. It's an extremely um, destructive practice, torture, um, on, of course, on those who receive this pain and suffering, but also on the society that becomes a society of cruelty. What we've done is we've not so much lost the war on torture as we've won the war on democracy. And that through terrorizing a population over a period of decades, so that there's nobody in this country who didn't grow up with some boogeyman, some danger. First it was communism, then it was terrorism. We are obviously engaged in many facets of what is generally called the Cold War, uh, which uh, the communist policy is forced upon us. But at no time has the CIA engaged in any political activity or any intelligence activity that was not approved at the highest level. was a concern that emerged at the very start of the Cold War in the late 1940s, that the Soviets had cracked the code of human consciousness, that they knew how to apply pressure upon the human mind and break the human mind. And it was that that set off this whole pursuit that led ultimately to the, the creation of the CIA's doctrine of psychological torture. This was a time of the brainwashing scare. There were show trials in Eastern Europe, um, in Hungary, in Poland, which aroused a lot of um, concern in the West because people seemed to be confessing to crimes that they hadn't committed. Most importantly was the trial of Cardinal Mainzensky in Hungary. Mainzensky was already, in, after World War II, quite famous because he was known for having resisted the Nazis in their occupation of Hungary. And then, after the war, he became the cardinal and the primate of the church. They arrested him, they confined him, he was accused of being an aristocrat. He became a kind of target of that regime. And then he was put on trial where publicly he confessed to the charges against him. And there was this fear in Washington that a prince of the church, 
mean, a cardinal, a man known for his courage under Nazi pressure, that if he could be broken, that clearly the Soviets were in possession of techniques. The CIA's reaction was primarily around what they thought was brainwashing, the concerns with communist brainwashing. What they never seemed to realize was that these t communist techniques were actually borrowed originally from earlier American techniques in the 1920s and 1910s using sleep deprivation, exhaustion exercises, all these other techniques were standard domestic policing tortures. Um, they were also driven by a second concern. There was a moral panic in the 1950s that um, American POWs in Korea, um, they confessed to things that were completely untrue and it didn't look like they had been tortured. During the Korean War, what happened was that there were captured downed American aviators, and uh, there were around 30 pilots that made testimonies. There were four pilots that broadcast on Radio Beijing, alleging that the United States was using bacteriological warfare against the Korean people. How can I go back and face my family? In a civilized world, how can I tell them these things? That I am a criminal in the eyes of humanity. They are my flesh and blood. It's the most difficult thing to really give a man's feelings. I can only tell you somewhat of how I feel. After the armistice, when these pilots were released, they were brought back. Uh, they were put through court martials and they realized that they had been put through what was then called brainwashing. Could you describe the methods used by the communist interrogators? Oh, yes. I would put these methods into two categories, uh, physical torture of a sort and mental torture. It consisted mainly of standing at attention, having my face slapped once in a while when I did fail to respond as they wanted me to, it consisted of being confined in a very close area. The mental treatment which they gave was a sort de designed to try to wear down my resistance to their interrogation, to break my willpower, to force me in some manner to confess. <laughs> CIA's Mind Control Project starts in 1950. This was a project of, that involved a billion dollars a year. There was a, a formal creation of British-Canadian-American cooperation at the highest levels in order to mobilize the behavioral scientists of these three countries in order to kind of crack the code of human consciousness. Dick Lone Wolf were medical doctors at Cornell University Medical School in New York City. They got access to some of the more classified material on people that had escaped from the Soviet Union and had been tortured in the Soviet Union. Wolf was a very well-known neurologist. He had a personal relationship with Alan Dulles, the head of the CIA. And with the Human Ecology Fund, Wolf offered to the CIA essentially a front in order to study questions of brainwashing. What they discovered um, was one, one of the two foundational techniques in the CIA doctrine of, of, of psychological torture. They discovered uh, uh, self-inflicted pain. What they described in, that, in their, in their co-author article was that the most devastating technique that the KGB or the NKVD practice was not crude physical beatings, but simply making a subject stand immobile 
for hours and days at a time. If you force a human being to stay in a certain position, especially a position that puts a little stress on ligaments or muscles or bones, joints, it doesn't take very long for the pain involved to become absolutely excruciating. But nobody's laying a figure, finger on you. You are doing it to yourself. That was one of the techniques. The other technique they discovered was from the, 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 the biomedical research. It was Dr. Hab's work. He was the chair of the psychology department at McGill University in Canada. Students volunteered to participate in this study of human behavior under extreme and prolonged monotony. Their hands and arms were softly covered to muffle a sense of touch. All harsh lights subdued by a mask, comfortable beds, quiet. And yet it was impossible for most of these students to take it for more than 24 or 48 hours. Sensory deprivation really is a way of producing extreme monotony. It's a horrible experience, getting worse and worse. Some of our subjects talked about cruelty. What they said was that the degree of boredom became intolerable and was, uh, one subject said, as bad as anything that, that uh, Hitler had ever done to any of his, sub to his uh, victims. As we know from almost any uh, basic medical understanding, uh, human contact is what makes us human and enables a person to have a sense of normalcy in their lives. And when they are completely isolated from any human contact and often kept in this sensory isolation, you will literally easily become severely mentally impaired. Peb then became a paid consultant to the CIA and continued to work for them. He's really the progenitor of modern psychological torture. Then the Wolf Project funded another guy at McGill named Dr. Ewan Cameron. What Ewan Cameron did at Allen Memorial Institute was, was close to monstrous. psychotherapy I was just crying 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 it was a uh, uh, hopeless I didn't know what to expect they said I was going to the psychiatric ward you met that man that's Cameron that's you and Cameron yes I met him and we were all terrified of him why we all felt fear that. we all had a fear of him and we didn't want him to notice us because whatever he did, whenever there was a patient with them, the patient was always screaming. These are the days and ours are the occasions. Professor Ewan Cameron was a very famous psychiatrist. He was head of the American Psychiatric Association and the World Psychiatric Association. He was the top of the field. At the same time, he seemed pretty much willing to do anything. And the, for the CIA to find a doctor who didn't have limits in um, a nearby capital with lots of patients to work with, lots of sub test subjects, was somebody they were interested in supporting. Patients would come in uh, uh, with ordinary psychological and emotional problems. They'd sign their waivers, and then they would be subjected to this bizarre version of extreme uh, sensory deprivation, you know, isolation for, for up to a month. One of his favorite things was he had a sort of a football helmet with a tape recorder in it that would play a tape on loop up to 500,000 times saying things like, my mother hates me. And he would blitz the brain with drugs, sensory deprivation, and kind of psychological emotional assault. Well, what's working? I mean, it's garbage. What he did was he would 
put people under massive electroshock, and he would give it to them on a prolonged basis, along with what he called sleep therapy. His idea was once you wipe the brain clean, you could wipe out the, uh, the uh, aberrant behavior, the bad uh, ideas, the ideas that were messing up people's minds, and you could program in other ideas. Electroconvulsive therapy picked up and was widely used in Germany before it went anywhere else as a way of returning soldiers to war. The German army wasn't going to spend tons of money on psychotherapy for regular soldiers, so they were looking for cheap and effective ways to send soldiers back to war. It then moves into the United States. clinical note of March 23rd of 1962 confirms 129 ECTs. Cameron's clinical note of September 12th recommends depatterning and sleep. The clinical notes of October 19th, November 1st, November 3rd, November 8th, November 15th all confirm depatterning at various stages. My sister knows that we're supposed to be acting strangely. And my mother decided to have uh, I decided to have me admitted to the Allen and find out what was wrong. So I, I went to the Allen uh, a couple of months later, and uh, that's when they started the shock treatments on me. And I was in the Allen for six months. And, and this would repeat? Yeah. Over days and days and weeks and... Yeah. Is it what you feel you have been through, being depatterned? Yes. Uh, I guess you might say you mean brought into a different world or being well, erased. Pattern, what does that mean? Being erased somehow? Could be, yeah. Well, they didn't finish the treatments with me, so when I came out, I was still active and so on. But they did, you went through three sessions of depatterning treatments and when I asked you about things before, you don't, you don't remember. Like, I'd say if I ask you what were you... What stuff were you typing for the National Defense, for instance? I don't remember that, no. Or there's certain things in your memory that you just don't remember. I was first hospitalized. I was about 16, 16 and a half the doctors pushed me into a sleep therapy and that was it for about three weeks in in a sort of a deep sleep but I don't remember getting up to go to the washroom I don't I just remember that the doctor came in occasionally to feed me and that was it and then shortly after a while there was another patient that came in and she was an older one and she slept in the other bed when I started to wake up I saw these patients, and these patients were in tubes, some of them, they had earphones and headphones. I don't know if they did any of that to me because when I, with the first three weeks, I don't know what happened, but this was depatterning. There's, there's a lot that, that my mom went through. And, and I can't say enough in terms of, you know, had she perhaps not gone through, you know, at the wrong time with the wrong doctor for the events that happened, you know, at the Allen. But it was hard, mom, because you didn't, make, you didn't make a decent living. You never made a decent living. You were on welfare most of your life. So, All I can say is that with so there's, the there's been, Cameron, yeah. I, a lot of me was destroyed, but I've managed to attain myself again back to myself again, all this time, all these years. The CIA's doctrine of psychological torture that they developed uh, through research in the decade of the 1950s and was codified in the Kubark Counterintelligence Interrogation Manual. In 
it has two basic techniques on which all the rest of the procedures derive. One is sensory deprivation, and the other is self-inflicted pain. The CIA trained allied agencies in the techniques. So in effect, you know, knowing about dissemination, about if you send these techniques to other armies, could you take an ordinary individual, like a draftee or a recruit, and make that person become an effective interrogator? And it seems that Milgram's experiment was likely part of this project. When I learn of incidents such as the destruction of millions of men, women, and children perpetrated by the Nazis in World War II, how is it possible, I ask myself, that ordinary people who are courteous and decent in everyday life can act callously, inhumanely, without any limitations of conscience. Under what conditions would a person obey authority who commanded actions that went against conscience? These are exactly the questions that I wanted to investigate at Yale University. The Milgram experiment, very simply, was uh, simulated torture. Uh, this was one, not, all the research we've been describing is the impact of interrogation upon the subject. Milgram had another agenda the impact of interrogation upon the interrogator. If he were to indicate the wrong answer, you would say wrong. Then tell him the number of volts you're going to give him. Then give him the punishment. Then read the correct word pair once. He got in ordinary people who fit by all the regular scales, very normal Americans, and then he subjected them under false color to, to doing what he called an educational experiment. In, try to encourage people to apply ever higher voltages as a false patient kept on getting making mistakes. In fact, Milgram was able to encourage, at least in his first experiments, I think close to 70% to go on to apply highly dangerous and sometimes fatal shocks. I'm not going to get that man sick of that. I mean, he's hollering in there. You know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> like, whether the learner likes it or not, we must go on until he's learned all the words. Uh, I refuse to take the responsibility of getting hurt in there. Get me out of here. You know, I'm not, I mean, he's Get under hollering. Get me out. Get me out. It's absolutely essential that you continue, teacher. There's too many left here. And I mean, geez, he, go, he gets wrong here. There's too many of them left. I mean, who's going to take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. All right, next one, slow. Walk, dance, truck, music. Answer, please. Wrong. 195 volts. Dance. Oh. Let me out of here. He did this simply with a very simple thing, putting the person behind a wall and having a person with a white lab coat telling them that they needed to continue. Very ordinary people can be influenced by situations. And it's one of the implications of both the Milgram experiment and the Zimbardo experiment. The Stanford prison experiment was, I think, a unique attempt to answer that question of what makes some people behave in a good way, but what makes some people behave in a bad way. And so the idea was, let's, let's find an evil place, and prisons everywhere in the world are evil places, and let's fill this evil place with only good people. To get the students involved, I had convinced the Palo Alto Police Department to make mock arrests of all the students who were going to be prisoners. And then they came down to the basement of Stanford Psychology Department, the place where the prison study was done. The idea is prison is made to feel inferior, insignificant, worthless. Uh, the most important thing is you take away their name, they become a number. 
And of course, given they have smocks with, with no uh, underpants, their behind is showing. My first hour in there, it was humiliating, but it was also abrupt. It was quick. It was just, you know, take them off, put this on, and then I got dusted with baking soda, which was supposed to be the de-louser, and I was led in the cell. What Zimbardo did was a very cheap knockoff of the kind of thing that Milgram was doing. Not only Zimbardo, but... Um, uh, I think, you know, the guard called John Wayne believed that ethics don't matter if the environment is artificial. And that's not true. All life is real life. We needed to get tougher with the prisoners. And it could well be that we were instructed by the experimenters to get tougher. In fact, I don't think we considered ourselves to be a subject of the experiment. We were merely a tool of the researchers to get the results they wanted from the real subjects, which we thought were the prisoners. And I decided uh, to become the nastiest uh, prison guard that I could make myself. Well, now you boys got to come to some kind of decision here. You think this is funny, or you want to sleep tonight? I love you too, American. Get up close. Get up close. I love you, 2093. I love you, 2093. You smile, 2093! You get down here and do 10 push-ups! 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, I was responsible nine, for coming up ten. with all of these routines that I would put the prisoners through, where I'd have them stand in a line, recite their numbers, do push-ups, do jumping jacks. Um, um, I had never once stopped to think that these prisoners uh, were suffering any harm or any damage. We're not, we're not beating anybody, we're just sort of applying psychological pressure on them. Come on, get in that closet then. You don't eat, you're not gonna hurt with energy for one second. It harms me. How did it, it harm you? How does it harm you? Just to think it, about it, it, you mean that people can be like that? It, yeah. It let me in on some knowledge that, that I've never experienced firsthand. Uh, I've read about it. I've read a lot about it. But I've never experienced it firsthand. I've never seen someone turn that way. And I knew you're a nice guy. You know? Well, you in position, what would you have done? I don't know. Situational forces can overwhelm, can dominate even the best of us. Ordinary people put in a bad, evil environment <clears throat> can become transformed to become part of that negative environment. And it's any of us, or in fact, most of us. The Office of Naval Intelligence, it was a pretty consistent cutout front for CIA. They funded much of this research. And I don't know if there was a yield that they they produce a yield for this cruel science? I don't, I, that's, it's, maybe I'm wrong. I just don't think they do. It might play out spectacularly in the military. So the connections would be much further down the road. It would be particularly um, uh, in the Iraq war and in the setting up of Gitmo and all of that. Um, and by the time you get to 2001, it's already this cultural artifact. Um, and so it is going to be picked up by, um, uh, by anyone for any purpose. The kind of people held at Guantanamo are not there because they stole a car. They're not common criminals. They're enemy combatants and terrorists who are being detained for acts of war against our country. And that is why different rules have to apply.
And mind you, the continuity is extraordinary. If you look at a sketch of the cubicle and of a student volunteer at McGill University. And then if you look, flash forward, to 2002, when the first Al-Qaeda suspects were being confined at Camp X-Ray at Guantanamo Bay. They're in goggles, gloves, and earmuffs that look, by God, just like that 1957 sketch. After 9-11, all of us working at PHR realized that there would very likely be a huge problem of uh, interrogation gone wild, meaning torture, cruel, and human and degrading treatment. The use of extreme isolation was one of a range of techniques that were employed by officials, interrogators, and so forth, literally starting all the way back in 2002 for many, many days. And that is just unbelievably destructive. I was the first civilian lawyer to go down there in the commission process. In a four to six month period, you see a marked deterioration in many respects. After a year or two in solitary confinement, you're going to ask the defendant for the first time in two years to, to, to interact with other human beings beyond his lawyer and his jailers. It's going to be the jury that's going to decide his life. He's going to be put on the stand, and that's where he's going to speak for the first time to the world for two years after being shut off from the world. It's impossible. I spent about nine years on active duty, and then I'm still in the reserves. In 2011, the uh, Department of Defense uh, assigned me to assist on the team representing Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the, the lead defendant in the 9-11 case. And what I can say is that the U.S. government has acknowledged that for the periods between 2003 and 2006, Mr. Mohammed was held at, um, at certain uh, undisclosed foreign locations. Black sites otherwise known as black sites, right. He was waterboarded over 183 times. That's correct. I can state that, right. Sodomized through a technique called rectal Right, that came out through um, Senator Feinstein's report. Here's a memos between the Department of Justice, uh, various organs of the US government to include the Department of Defense, the Central Intelligence Agency, as to what types of enhanced interrogation techniques would be authorized for certain types of detainees. When they began confining people in Guantanamo, they moved uh, to uh, having psychologists do interviews with patients to discover individual flaws, uh, individual sources of trauma, insecurity. And then they, they also discovered because they were dealing mainly with, with Arabs and Muslims, uh, that uh, Muslim males are uniquely uh, upset by nudity and also by female physical contact, and then fear of dogs. Race has always played a role in American torture. It's the American torture techniques are part of old military punishments, um, punishments that were used on slaves, um, and, um, and you might find that strange, but there was one area where slaves were never whipped, but you used clean techniques on them, so they didn't leave marks, and that was if you were going to sell a slave, because a slave that had whip marks means that they were not going to obey, and so a clean slave was, so got a higher price. The cotton industry 
in the southern delta states of the United States depended completely on torture. Over the course of four decades, human beings, by using their bodies as a technological form, as a technological machine, were able to multiply by eight times the amount of cotton an individual person could pick in a single day. So the use of torture is absolutely tied at the root from the very beginning. In these kinds of cases, many people in the system and the people who are imposing these conditions believe that ordinary punishment is too good for these people. And a lot of it is about the otherness of them, religiously, ethnically, uh, nationally, culturally. It's easier than it would be to someone from your own community to do that. So. In Guantanamo, uh, <clears throat> Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld uh, appointed a commander, Jeffrey Miller, whose job it was to extract information. And uh, Jeffrey Miller made up a CD, or staffed it, and uh, he flew to Iraq, and uh, under the, uh, uh, with the permission of the commander there, General Sanchez, he then ran training sessions for the interrogators and the staff at Abu Ghraib Prison, where he transmitted the Guantanamo techniques to the Abu Ghraib staff. Basically, the restraints were removed, and they were told to get results. The thing that became so clear is that what the United States was doing was not a secret. It was hidden in plain sight. It wasn't really until the photographs from Abu Ghraib were released, which were just, you know, the tip of the iceberg of what was actually happening, that people in this country began actually talking about it. Uh, what we did in Iraq was exactly the right thing to do. And if I had it to recommend all over again, I would recommend exactly the right same course of actions. Uh, that we did exactly the right thing. Have you ever seen them all? Not all of them. I can give them to you. Well, there was one, there's 1,600 of them. We've only seen, I think, about 20, maybe 30. There's 1,600. And they, they, the, the worst ones are, are the ones we haven't seen. So, and, and yes, they were violating uh, military regulations and what they were doing, but the, the, they were operating within a system in which they were conditioned, they were structured in order to violate those laws. When you arrived at Abu Ghraib, were you aware of what had happened there? Uh, Almost immediately after we arrived at Abu Ghraib, we, we were briefed that uh, there was misconduct, but we weren't given details. And the interrogators uh, that I knew who had been there during that time, didn't, they didn't talk about it. 
So we, we didn't know. I, I learned everything through the news. We understood the Geneva Conventions to mean that absolutely, you know, you, 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 couldn't, you, you couldn't harm anybody in your care, that your primary responsibility was their well-being uh, rather than putting them in distress. But then we were confused, and then, you know, of course, we got uh, these memos from the Justice Department and from the Pentagon um, authorizing the use of much more harsh techniques. We started adopting those techniques when I was stationed in Mosul. Among them were stress possessions, sleep deprivation, uh, inducing hypothermia, uh, just any, any way we could put them in, in, in distress, using dogs. This is, this is a sl so-called slippery slope. So the take the gloves off policy allowed uh, American interrogators from going from a certain uh, list of techniques that were, let's say, allowed, and even those were already torture, to doing extreme things, um, rape and sodomy and, um, you know, uh, the most extreme forms of physical and psychological brutality. You can just torture somebody on a whim without knowing how to do it. And the reality, of course, is that torture, like any physical skill, right, requires training, requires practice, it requires an institutional setting, a built environment, really. You need to have this institutionalized mm -hmm. space, physical space, in which you can perform torture. We want, you know, we. We wanted to be successful. I was against the war. I'm a, you know, a liberal. I didn't vote for George Bush. Um, but I wanted to do my job well. You know, I felt like you know, if, if I could be successful and get intelligence from these people, then we could end the war quickly, and it would be better for, for Iraq, better for, for us and the people I was working with. There's been a focus, a few who have betrayed our values and sullied the reputation of our country. And with six or seven investigations underway and a military justice system that has values, we know that those involved, whoever they are, will be brought to justice. I was angry at our leadership because I, I knew that uh, they were prosecuting interrogators and guards and leadership wasn't being held accountable. I, um, I, I was disappointed in myself and uh, our behavior over there was terrible. So I was, I was, I was very angry. When the Abu Ghraib trial happened, uh, I, I got a call from the lawyer for Chip Frederick and he asked me to act as part of the defense team. I said, well, the person that you should really talk to is Zimbardo. He ran this experiment in the 1970s, and the situations at Abu Ghraib, as far as I can tell, are those conditions that are also reproduced in the um, Zimbardo experiments. Chip Frederick, he's... The man here... Mm -hmm. He was the one who had the idea of putting electrodes on in the hood. His lawyer said, the problem now is the military want to use him in a show trial in Baghdad. In Abu Ghraib, not only, not a single senior officer went to trial, not a single senior officer got a what called letter of reprimand. In fact, in some cases, they even got promoted, uh, the, the officers. Uh, so it's, it's the people at the top always take care of the people at the top. Um, for those uh, individuals who were directed by, by the US government to, to engage in, in any technique that I believe would rise to the level of torture or cruel or inhuman or degrading treatment, I think they lose a little bit of themselves every time they have to commit an inhuman act. And um, 
you know, my, I, my heart goes out to them as well, uh, uh, frankly. Uh, I don't think I noticed that until I got back. And then, um, you know, I, the tremendous guilt and I think uh, I, a lot of us developed signs that uh, were uh, later diagnosed as PTSD, but I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that um, they have another name for it now, and I think it was, it's called like uh, moral, moral failure. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a feeling that people come back with after uh, being in war, if they, they feel like they, they've, they've done things that are outside of their, their moral um, compass. We're still evaluating how we are going to uh, approach the whole issue of interrogations, detentions, uh, and so forth. And uh, I don't believe that anybody is above the law. Uh, on the other hand, I also have a belief that we need to look forward as, low, as opposed to look, looking backwards. We'll look forward, we won't look backward. Well, Forward is going to be like backward if you don't do something about what happened in the past. Nobody has been held accountable for the torture that happened in the past. And for this, among other people, I fault uh, President Obama. Essentially, he gave everybody, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, he gave them all a free pass. George W. Bush, they're all going to be rehabilitated. They're all going to be treated as great statesmen one day. I mean, they gave President Obama a Nobel Prize for not being George W. Bush. The question, of course, that we're all tap dancing around, and we, you know, we're avoiding is, does it work? Does torture work? It doesn't work. People that have information that are part of an underground apparatus, a terrorist organization, a revolutionary organization, a communist organization, whatever organized form of, of collective violence it might be, they won't break, you know? And the people that you pick up that are innocents, yes, you'll, you, you'll tear them to pieces, you'll destroy them, you'll, you'll ruin them. I think that a few of the people that passed passed through uh, my hands as an interrogator did have intelligence. But mo the vast majority of the people that I dealt with were just being picked up because they were males of military age and they would just get swept up in, in these raids. I, I don't think um, torture is always being used as a method to gain information or, or confessions. It's often just being used uh, out, of, out of anger and fear. After September 11th attacks, September 11th, 2001, a very well-known Harvard Law professor, Alan Dershowitz, uh, came up with uh, the ticking bomb theory. And he said, so what happens, for example, if a terrorist has a ticking time bomb, a small nuclear bomb in Times Square, and the bomb's ticking, and we only have so much time, we must torture. And then, you know, the show 24, of course, started every segment with that giant clock ticking away, you know, uh, and, and it, it kind of gave a visual reality, a visual imprint that resonated with this discussion of ticking time bombs. An entire season of television yes. devoted to one unforgettable... You've got five seconds. ...day. The clock starts ticking. First season of 24 was already in the can when 9-11 happened. In addition to the way that it framed our reception of torture on a popular level just among the civilians, in Guantanamo itself, they were getting pressure from the Department of Defense and they have these meetings. And in the meetings, they screened the second season of 24. 
and use that as a jumping off place to decide what tortures, what methods they were going to propose to Donald Rumsfeld that they would use against the people they were holding in Guantanamo. I think it was very influential on the people that I worked with. Um, I, I know that some of the techniques that people wanted to use, they had, they had seen on television programs. For instance, I mentioned to you our leaders wanted us to do mock, and, mock executions um, and also using electricity. And these were things that they had seen on television. It's, I mean, no, no one trained us on that. It wasn't, um, that was simply from television. States. We have this picture of torture as something that is done by the lonely person, the lonely hero, the man who does it more in sorrow than in anger because he's absolutely forced to because so many lives depend on it. He's willing to take the moral stain and the moral pain on him and in order to save all these people. There was always this anxiety in American politics um, which is that democracy kinds of makes, makes us weaker and less capable of taking the real things that real men should be able to do. There's a very gendered, masculinist sort of notion behind this. Real men torture and, and, and democracy makes us sissies. In the Middle East, we have people chopping the heads off Christians. We have things that we have never seen before. I would bring back waterboarding, and I'd bring back a hell of a lot worse than waterboarding. Today, here in New York, terrorism people could be on pretrial detention in MCC 10 South for two years. They're going anywhere. The anger that came from 9-11, people who, who think that somehow it's cathartic to then impose similar pain on someone you think is responsible for it, this is the opportunity. Would you say that um, Manhattan uh, MCC is, while hidden in plain sight, a black site on American soil? Yes. I would say it's a black site, not in the sense of the black sites that people are being taken out and tortured, but they're being tortured in the way that their daily lives are being managed or not managed. Uh, they're not living a daily uh, a life. They are a a neglected product in a warehouse where there's no maintenance. <laughs> you know, I mean, think of it as like the most. It's the most soul-negating place I've ever been. One of the things that we need to consider now, and has become quite an issue, is how many of these soldiers who used to participate in these kinds of American techniques are now policemen and immigration officers who manage Mexicans and Hispanics and other sorts of things in integrations today. There's already beginning to be evidence that these old techniques, including freezing rooms, um, sleep deprivation, all these things are now being used uh, on, on, on immigrants and children. So this is one of the terrible things about techniques is that they circulate between war and home. And whatever you do in war comes home. clean, then we can feel that the thing that's being done to protect us isn't really so bad. We have become used to the idea that it is a legitimate moral stance that we do anything we need to in order to feel safe, to feel secure. And in a bizarre way, it's as if the government is trying to make a deal with us. You let us do whatever we want over here on the dark side, and in return, I promise you will never die. It's like this fake promise of immortality. But of course we're gonna die.
When the history of the American empire is written 50 years from now, historians might have to say, as French historians have said about France in Algeria, that, that something was lost in the US embrace of torture. The moral authority that made America a world leader was sacrificed for this, this chimera of effective interrogation.